could be doing anything. I could do furniture or whatever. Just I make wooden toys. The woodworking, it just kind of evolved. And so we took a simple concept like toys and made it an art form and that worked. And I think that's why it worked. I was a high school counselor. And so then I did that for 25 years and ran the business on the side. And it, it worked out. I just did two jobs, you know. But it was a nice blend because I deal with kids and parents all day. And then I come home and go to my shop and it actually made sense. <laughs> In 1976, uh, I, before that I did it as a hobby. And then my accountant says, you know, you better start keeping track of this or you're gonna go to jail. So in 1976, I made it a company and that's when we started keeping records and making sense out of it and been doing it ever since, so. And I love to create. And so then that was half of the early years is I was always coming up with ideas. It wasn't hard because it was a diversion. And it was therapy, actually, yes. And so, like, the first car I made at Summer Art Fair of all places on a card table, and my goal was to sell one a month. One. And I sold six at the first show. My wife says, you know, I have to figure this out now. <laughs> so that's how it all started. And, and it was the high-end toys, not the kids' toys. From there, I kept introducing more and more high-end, like the train and that, and it worked and we found a niche that I could get into all the good shows. Yeah, we didn't have any other income. And at church, they said, well, if you don't make it, we can help you with food. <laughs> so we just go like that. And it takes a little bit of time, but that way they're nice and safe and it. It's a final inspection, actually. So when we do this, we kind of look at the wheels, make sure they're solid. Everything's glued on, so it's, and then, once they get them, it'll be safe and it seals the wood. It makes it kind of look there. Life as an artist on the road, right? I've worn out a lot of trucks. To sell as an artist, you have to travel and you have to go where people live. We go to Philadelphia, we go to Baltimore, we go to Texas, we go to Chicago. Uh, Ball and Toys wouldn't exist if we didn't have art shows. What that did was let us meet masses. I know the internet, I know the all the Facebook and all that. That's great, but the, the people, they have to see you and the product. People come to the show and they want to meet the artist. When we're talking to people, they can sense we sweated. I mean, we still got all our fingers, but yeah, we made them. I tried not doing some shows for about five months and things dry up and then you don't have that repeat customer. You can't just put a picture on the web and think they're just gonna send you money. It just doesn't work. <laughs> and lo and behold, you're gonna end up with a truck. And this person wanted their garage on the side. This was actually her father's garage and she was so sad he's not with them anymore, but he wanted to remember that. So that's how that works. Got the wheels, and away you go. Summer Art Fair is where I started. First show I ever did. It's a great market for Omaha for us, and we build a following in Omaha. It's a good show for us. COVID-19, that was a rank. When they closed schools, I knew we were in trouble. See, we had some shows in January, February, March. They started canceling. And then I thought, well, maybe May. They canceled. June, some art fair, canceled. July, they canceled. August, September, and we're going, whoa, this is the first time ever that I'll probably lose the whole year. I've driven to Baltimore and have it snow, lose the show. Philadelphia. I've been in Houston and they canceled the show because the hurricane was coming through. That's no big deal. One show. You come home, you're all, oh God, I'm loaded and ready for the next show. No, there's no shows. They're all canceled. So we've had to adjust that this year is going to be without shows. We've tried frantically trying to do some online stuff to pay the insurance. We're not getting any wages, you know. So we'll survive this year 
and then we'll see what happens. It's forced us to be creative. We introduce a new item every week, but it has to be $50. The high-end $1,000 toys just won't sell on Etsy or on the web or that. The blessing might be, if we can survive, is next year we'll have that base, which is getting larger and larger, and we'll also be able to do shows. This is weird. I mean, this is totally, and everybody's in the same boat. I mean, uh, yeah, so it's just a matter, we gotta figure out how to survive. I get distracted easily because I can vary, and I'm not good at production, because I'll, I'll do maybe 10, like when I was cutting those trains, that's about it, because I'm thinking about something else. I'm thinking about doing a new idea or, yeah, no. So I would never make a factory worker because I can't stay on task. I have to do something, but I'll always be creating stuff. This building's not going away. There's so many creative ideas that it's, it's just, and it's timeless. We don't have to worry about a palette color or if it's the deal of the month. This is the first car and it's still the most popular because it's timeless. It's not gonna go away because the next generation loves it too, so. I wish I could give you a 10, she said. This is my first order. I'm so impressed with the item that I placed a second order right away. Outstanding work, timeless gift. It'll be kept forever. Love this little train. Got it for my daughter's first birthday. She obsessed with it, and frankly, I did too. The quality is impeccable. I plan for it to be around for generations. So that's what we do is we come up with an idea that's clever and quality made. Everyone's different because of the wood. You don't sell them at a garage sale for a dime. And when the kids are teenagers put on their shelf, their kids use them. So that's the way it ends.